Our gracious God, we ask your blessing to be upon us this day. As we have read from your holy word, we pray that you might speak to us those truths our hearts need to hear. Challenge our faith and help us to grow in our understanding of your love and your grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, today is a very exciting Sunday in the life of the church because there are so many things going on, and any one of them is worthy of all the attention that we might want to give to it, and yet there are so many different things. Today is Christ the King Sunday. That's the last Sunday of the Christian year. That's the time that we celebrate Christ is the King. Because next Sunday will be the first Sunday in Advent, and we will start the cycle all over again, going through the Christian year and all of the seasons that we attend to. But this Sunday, today, is the final Sunday. It's the end of the year. It's the time that we celebrate the triumph of Christ. It also happens to be Thanksgiving Sunday. It happens to be the Sunday that we're going to have our dinner this evening. We're also celebrating the hanging of the green with another service. So it really gets complicated as to what you want to focus on, and I've sort of experienced a little bit of whiplash this week trying to figure out what to do when because there are so many wonderful things. But today, for these few moments that we have together, I want us to focus our attention on what it means to truly celebrate Christ as King. A friend of mine once described the Bible as being able to be divided into six simple words. Now think about that for a moment. You can take the entire Bible and six simple words can describe what it says. And those simple words are this. God created. God loved. God wins. Everything else is filler. Everything else is simply the detail. Those simple six words describe what God is at work at in our own hearts and in our own lives. And so we come today to celebrate Christ the King. He wins. And because of that, we are triumphant. We can be a part of that winning experience. We too can feel that joy and that peace of knowing that God has won the battle. And so we read this passage of Scripture. In the last day, all the nations will be gathered together and there will be a judgment. Now we don't like to hear that. We're too modern for that. In fact, we say to people, don't you judge me. Well, let's be honest. Every time you get up in the morning and walk outside, you're being judged. You're being judged by whether you're wearing the right clothing or whether it matches. You're being judged by how you act. You're being judged by what you do. Every moment of our lives, we are being judged because we do that to everyone else around us. We're constantly judging people. And so it should be no surprise that Jesus says there is going to be that time of judgment when all the nations will be gathered together and the king, Christ the king, will judge the people. And that judgment is going to be a revelation of our hearts and our lives. Now in the scripture it talks about sheep and goats. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we knew the difference? But we don't. And I know there are some who might say, well, I have a list of the sheep and I have a list of the goats. Or we might even be so bold as to call out those who are sheep and goats. I am not that bold or stupid. Because I have to admit to you that there are some days that I am a goat. And I will confess that. There are some days that I do not feel like I'm doing what God would want me to do. And when I think I'm a sheep, I also have to be careful because am I really being a sheep for God or am I doing it for myself? 
Look at how good I am. Look at how wonderful I am. Look at me. Well, either way, we're not living up to God's potential. Because when we feel like that we may not, being do, might not be doing God's will, when we feel like that we're far from the kingdom, we may actually be closer than we realize. And when we feel like that we're right on the mountaintop doing something for God and the kingdom, we may be far, far away because our, our actions and our attitudes are not where they need to be. And that's why I'm so glad that I don't have to be the judge. That God does the judging. And God has given us a prescription of how we meet the test, how we meet the standard. For he's going to divide the nations according to two groups, the goats and the sheep, and they're going to be divided according to what they do to what? The least of these my people. And so when we feed the hungry, when we clothe the naked, when we give shelter to the homeless, when we help those who are in need, we are not only helping that person, but we are helping Christ. For we're doing it for those who have struggled with society and with the problems of life and we're trying to make certain that they too feel included into this family of God. One of the biggest mistakes that can occur to a church is when we feel like we're above others. And when we get that attitude of being above, we're far from God's grace and love. For God loves all of humanity and he wants us to be a part of that kingdom. And so you might say, well, why is there a judgment then? If God loves everybody, then everybody wins. Everybody gets in. But you know, we make a, a mistake that I think we all made, and I made it when I was going to school especially. Whenever I was going to school, I liked to be the teacher's pet. Were you ever the teacher's pet? I mean, it's great. All you have to do is just give these teachers just a little more attention Bring them an apple or two, be extra nice, and you'll get straight A's. Then I ran into one teacher that I couldn't buy off. I mean, this teacher gave me no grace whatsoever. She graded my homework with an eagle eye, and I think she used more red pencils on me than anyone else in the room. And she'd mark up my papers and grade time would come around and I think, oh Lord, please, please. It's amazing how we pray to God in times like that. Lord, please change the grades so I'll get a good one. And I didn't. Now whose fault was that? Was that the mean old teacher? No. That was me. I wasn't doing the work. I was playing a game. I thought I could get away with just looking good and acting right, and I wasn't learning the material. Finally, I realized in school that if I was ever going to succeed, I needed to realize that the teacher was my best friend. And a teacher who marked up my papers with all that red pencil was actually doing me a great and wonderful favor because it showed that they cared and it showed that they read it and it showed that they wanted me to do better than I was doing. When you get that paper back that just says A-OK, -okay, that really doesn't tell you anything. And so I soon realized that it is what we do that determines where we are in the kingdom. It's not what, whether God loves us or not. God's love for us is sufficient for all of humankind. God wants everyone to be in the kingdom. You notice that he said that those who are departed toward hell, those who are departed toward punishment, that that was made for the devil and his angels. It was never made for the people of God. And yet there are people who choose not. Choose not to follow God. They care more about themselves. 
than they care about others. They feast, and their neighbors starve. They have an abundance, but they never share. They hoard, they hold on, they build bigger barns, better investments, and they never share. And Jesus says, someday there's going to be a judgment. Someday we're going to be held accountable. Now there's another interesting thing going on in this passage. Notice that the sheep don't know that they're sheep. Think about that for a moment. They don't realize that they're doing good. It has become such second nature to them that they can't tell the difference between their close neighbor and the person who is a stranger. In other words, they treat both equally. It becomes an attitude of their heart and their life. They simply give. Give for joy, give for happiness, give because God has blessed them, give because God is there guiding them and leading them. And they don't realize. They say, Lord, when did we see you in these different places? When did we experience you this way? And Jesus says, when you've done it to the least of these in my family, you've done it unto me. And so when we help the poor, when we help the church be the church, we make a difference not only in the lives of those that we help, but we respond to God's grace in a way that brings us into that kingdom of eternal reward. The goats didn't know they were goats. They said, Lord, if we'd seen you, we'd have done it. If we'd noticed that it was you, yes. But we have to remember that God is very subtle. And God appears to us in ways that we don't always recognize or understand that God may be working in a neighbor or a friend or a relative and we have a choice and a chance as to whether we're going to respond as God would have us to respond. In other words, our giving and our living becomes a part of just being generous to people who are around us because we realize that someday we're leaving this world. Someday we're all going to die, and then we will have the judgment. It's not a scary prospect when we know that God is our Savior. It's not something to fear when we put God into our heart and our life. It's not something that we should hold back from when we allow God to, to worship Him in the fullness of the Spirit, when we realize that Jesus Christ is my King. I'm going to close the service this morning with a video that I hope will bring that home to you in a fresh and new way. It's a video with C.M. Lockridge, who recorded this most famous presentation of That's My King. Remember, God created God loves, and God wins. Will you play the video, please? The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. That's my is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's endurably strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizons of this world. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the Lord.
most of his idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be at all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He's God and he dies. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a low way of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't have him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Amen. That's my king. That's why we're here today. Not to look good on TV. We're here to go out and to witness for Christ, to make a difference in our world. That's my king. The king that wants to touch our lives and make us what God wants us to be.